Well, we're here today with Tom Campbell, Thomas W. Campbell, author of My Big Toe, A Theory of Everything. Tom, welcome and thank you for being here today. I thought we would talk a little bit about a subject that is very much discussed in recent times more than ever, and that is UFOs and other realities and aliens. I thought it would be interesting for you to comment on your idea of traveling with mind and how do you recommend this and how do you see this traveling with mind to other realities and how would you explain UFOs in terms of your theory of everything? There is a lot of interest in UFOs and there's a lot of belief that UFOs exist. You know, if we go back 50 or 60 years, everybody would have said that UFOs were silly. That's just stuff that Hollywood makes up. But today, that's not the case. Today, there's a, there's a lot more uh, interest in it, scientific interest in it, uh, people uh, looking at various sightings, and there's lots of people involved in it. And it's not just one thing. The perspectives there go from the scientific to the I was abducted kind of experience. So it's a really broad field. If we just talk about UFOs, that's, that's a hugely wide thing to talk about. But I'm going to approach it from the viewpoint of my big toe through, through my model of reality. And not that this is the, you know, the last word on UFOs at all from my model. It's just a different perspective. It's a different approach. It's another way of looking at the, that UFO phenomena from basically the direction of my model of reality and how do UFOs fit into that, to that model. Uh, as you know, my model of reality is about uh, consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental. We're all part of this larger consciousness system. So indeed, the old uh, uh, wise sages uh, that said, we're all one, you know, we're all uh, connected. That's true. Uh, we are. We're all part of this larger consciousness system. And we, you know, you and I and all the rest of the homo sapiens running around on this particular planet are all in a virtual reality. Our bodies are virtual bodies. We are a piece of consciousness. In this larger consciousness system, we're a piece of consciousness and we are playing our body. Our body is the avatar. You know, consciousness plays avatars. That's the way it works in a game. If you're playing The Sims, then you are the consciousness. The player is the consciousness for the Sim character. And the, the player makes all the choices for the Sim player. Okay, so the Sim player itself is not conscious. It's the player that's conscious. Well, that's the way it is in our virtual reality as well. It's the player. That's what we are. The player is conscious and makes all the choices for this uh, human avatar. Okay, now, how is this virtual reality computed? Well, the larger consciousness system is an information system. Consciousness is all about information. I define consciousness as awareness, with a choice. Well, awareness is about information. You know, awareness, what am I aware of? Oh, I'm aware of this, this, and this, you know, in my environment, I'm aware of myself. Well, all that awareness is just information about this, this, and this, and myself. It's, you know, awareness is based on information, and choice is based on information. Uh, I have these choices because I have information on these things, and I have, I'm conscious, so I have awareness. And I have this choice, so which one of these do I want to do, or which are the ones I don't want to do? So consciousness is just awareness with a choice. And a consciousness system, by definition, is an information system. So if you have a fundamental information system that is the source of everything, and I might add, this information system is not supernatural, it's not infinite, it's not perfect, it's not necessarily all-knowing. It's just a natural system. 
that started as a one tiny little piece of consciousness, called it a consciousness cell, if you like, and that piece of consciousness evolved, and it evolved into the system, okay? And it created a virtual reality, okay? Because if you are a, an information system, eventually, you know, information means you you make things that well, the best way to say it is, is that if you have a system and all the bits are random, there is no information. So you make information by ordering those bits to have some sort of meaning. Whether that's a symbolic meaning or a direct meaning, doesn't matter, but you create information by ordering the bits. Now, when you order things you know, that were random and you order them, that can also be described as entropy, lowering entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. So if we have a system, all the bits are random, then it has very high. For the system, it has you know, totally high entropy. As soon as it orders some bits, the entropy goes down a little because now it's just ordered things. Ordering things lowers entropy. So an information system evolves by lowering its entropy. So we have this big system. It's a, conscious, it's a consciousness, it's aware, it makes choices. And in order to evolve, it needs more and, and different kinds of choices. It needs this, its choice space, which we call the decision space, it needs to grow. And if you're one monolithic thing, then your decision space is limited. You're just this one consciousness. So it's split apart pieces of itself. And I call those individuated units of consciousness. They have free will. And they interact now with each other and with the system. Now the possibilities just went up. So the decision space just got bigger. The possibilities of the system grows when this happens. So these IUOCs and the larger conscious system were kind of chatting in a big chat room. That's what consciousness does. It exchange information. It's an information system, right? These are all little subsets of information systems so they're smaller information systems so what do they do well they exchange information so think of it as a big chat room because of that uh being a big chat room their evolution was very slow because you evolve by making choices if the quality if your choices lower entropy then you're evolving positively if the choices you make increase entropy you're evolving uh, you're de-evolving, let's put it that way, you're evolving in a negative direction, okay? So that's just a little bit of the background. I'm trying to give you a very quick background because I'm going to talk about the larger consciousness system and people have to know just what that is. So in my model, consciousness is the only thing that's fundamental. Everything else is created out of consciousness. So consciousness said, hey, we're not evolving you individual units of consciousness are not evolving very quickly because the choices are all very minor. It's just what to say and what not to say, what, what link to turn on, what link to turn off, you know, connections to other IUOCs. So it said what we need is a, is a context in which our interaction has more meaningful choices. So it created this virtual reality and it didn't program it. It created it by getting a set of initial conditions and a rule set of how those conditions would change with time, pushes the run button, and this virtual reality evolves. And eventually it evolved into what we call the physical universe. So it's a simulation being simulated within consciousness. So a piece of the larger conscious system configures itself as a computer and serves up this virtual reality. And we, individuated units of consciousness, log on be the players of those avatars in this virtual reality. All right, now our virtual reality is the whole universe, not just Earth, but the whole universe. All the planets, all the stars, all the dust, all the pretty lights that you see on uh, you know, NASA, NASA photographs, all of that, the whole universe is our virtual reality. All right, now, one thing about a virtual reality is it's only skin deep. Right? It only computes what the players see. There's no sense computing something that a player isn't going to be able to see or interact with. 
So you just compute what you see. So when you play a Sims character, that Sims character doesn't have a heart and a circulatory system and lungs and their environment doesn't have to have oxygen in it. All of that's unnecessary. It, you just make that Sims character move around as if it had lungs, as if there were oxygen, as if uh, you know, those things were necessary. But if your character falls in a swimming pool and can't get out, it drowns. Why? Because it gets tired, can't get out of the pool, and eventually it drowns. At least that's the way the Sims game worked a long time ago when my daughter was playing it. It looks like they need oxygen. So you see, it's as if there were oxygen there, but oxygen isn't modeled in the Sims game. Well, our game is the same way. Oxygen's not modeled here either, unless you do some kind of experiment that shows oxygen, which you can see and interact with oxygen. Then that interaction has to interact as if there were oxygen. So if you have that idea that we are really consciousness, this whole universe of ours is really a virtual reality, and we individuated units of consciousness are the players in this virtual reality. So when you have that idea, then this idea of UFOs takes on a little different perspective. So that's why I started with, you know, this is kind of the overall view of, of, my, of my model. So other realities are things that we can easily get to. Now, sometimes other realities are called, a person says they've gone out of their body. Well, they don't really go out of their body. They're already out of their body, their consciousness. All they have to do is, is focus their intention on someplace else, some other reality. And there are lots of virtual realities out there. When your avatar dies, your awareness ends up in another virtual reality. So there's literally hundreds of virtual realities that are available to us, one of which is this physical universe. And that's the one our avatar is in. But our avatar can sit down in a chair, say its mantra or whatever it wants to do, you know, look at it, think about its breath and meditate and let go of its awareness of this physical universe. And when it does that, it's now just aware as consciousness. Okay. And it can do multiple things as aware of consciousness. You can just float there, what I call point consciousness, you know, just a point of consciousness floating in the void. Or it can go off and do other things, travel to other reality systems. It can get data from databases. Now, these databases, you know, the Hindus called those the Akashic records. But there really are databases there, and they're not magical. It's the databases that are required by the server to produce the virtual reality. There's some information that is necessary for the computer to have in order for it to make this, you know, the rendering engine that makes this virtual reality we call the physical universe needs some databases to do that with. And these databases are just there. So one other attribute of consciousness is that every consciousness is connected. And we can connect with not only every other consciousness, including your dog and your cat and your horse, or your significant other, or just any conscious. But you have to open the link, and you can close the link. Now, you can also connect with these databases because they're in consciousness. And when you, your mind, when you, you know, go sit down and you meditate and you just become just mind, you let go of the body, then you're free to make these connections. You can go places, do things, and you can go places. You know, when I say go places, you're not really going places. You're just getting data streams, different data streams. So when I'm in this thing I call the physical universe, I get a data stream from the server that I then interpret that data as this physical reality. Okay, when I'm not in this reality, I'm in some other reality, I'm getting a different data stream from the larger conscious system that gives me some other virtual reality. I think yeah. that people can understand, I think people can understand that analogy. Um, so what you're saying is you travel 
to these everything's information and you can travel to these other realities what we call alien planets um, and things like that and you can do that with your mind now those are virtual realities to these other realities that you speak of and that you have traveled to as consciousness have different rule sets they even have different fundamental times and as consciousness you simply grab onto that data stream how would you recommend if people do understand that this kind of travel is through mind through consciousness how would you recommend connecting to that what has been your experience with how the rule sets differ and also how time differs okay well we'll talk about that just a little but then i want to come back to talk about things that happen in this physical universe. Because if people talk about uh, UFOs, they're pretty much limiting themselves to what happens inside this virtual reality. You know, the UFOs, they would say, come from other planets in other parts of this physical universe. And that is the UFO phenomena. Now, what you're saying makes the point that that's not necessarily true. That... Uh, you know, that, that may be true, but it's not necessarily true that everything that uh, you see in different realities is part of this physical universe. There are other virtual realities beside the one we call our physical universe. Lots of other virtual realities, and some of them are very much like our physical universe in the sense that they're, they're physical. Physical is just defined by the rule set. If the rule set defines every energy exchange is defined by the rule set, or you might say it's defined by the physics of the rule set, okay, then the, the, that, rea that virtual reality feels physical to you because every interaction, you know, you do this and that causes something else. There's this causality that makes it feel physical. But when we talk about physical and non-physical, there really isn't any fundamental difference between physical and non-physical. Wherever the observer is, that reality seems physical. Wherever the observer is not, that seems non-physical. Okay, so physical and non-physical are just the perspective of the observer. So if you're in a, in a dream, at nighttime, you're, you're in a dream, that dream seems physical. There's things there. There's things you do, things you say, people you interact with, things you can pick up, clothes you wear, you know, cars to drive. There's all sorts of things going on there that are physical. And while you're having that dream, the what we call the physical universe is non-physical. It doesn't really exist physically. So you see, that means that what's physical simply is a perspective of the individual. The only thing that's real is consciousness. So all the experiences you can have, all the reality frames, all the kinds of experiences that you can have take place in a virtual reality. Okay. Consciousness itself is the only thing that's real. So it's the fundamental thing. So if you go to one of these other reality frames, what you're getting is an information so information from the larger conscious system that defines that reality. Now, I have traveled around in different realities. I've found, you know, some dozen or so that are like the physical universe, very much the same way. You know, they have suns and planets and trillions of stars, and, you know, they have a similar kind of thing that ours does. Some are different. Sometimes you go there and you just observe. You're like an observer. You're not actually there in that reality, but you observe the reality. You interact with it. Other times, you can interact with it directly. You have a body there. Take on an avatar in that place. But to do that, you have to have the cooperation of the larger conscious system because your avatar has to be added to the data stream that the other entities in that reality have. So that's not something you can force. That's something you request. And if you have a good reputation for not causing 
difficulties, then you can do that. So if I can get a body, if I can get an avatar in some other reality frame, then obviously some other entity from some other reality frame could get an avatar. Sure. So that's a possibility. But it always has to be, be implemented by the system. So it's only going to be implemented. It's not that they can just come and do what they want, whenever they want, how they want. You know, uh, It doesn't work like that. And there's very strict rules when you enter another reality system. If you take on an avatar there, there's rules. You can't just change things and, you know, leave a big footprint and raise a lot of hell, you know, that's just not allowed to just take you right out. You will just disappear if that's the case. So there are rules about what you can do. And this is now in consciousness. These other realities are not this physical reality. There's some other physical reality, okay? not this one. So there's many of those. And then there's lots of other virtual realities that don't have a tight rule set that don't define every possible interaction, like your dream reality. In that dream reality, you can teleport. Things can just appear and disappear, and you can be in this dream, and then bingo, you're in some other dream doing something else. So all those, you know, it doesn't have a tight rule set. There isn't an unbroken stream of causality. Things can hop and jump around in a flash. So those rule sets have are, are not so tight. I just say a tight rule set is one that, that defines everything or a very loose rule set defines a few things like where you are and who you're talking to. And you may be talking to somebody and there is no environment. It's just you and them. And the environment's really not there. So you're getting a data stream of this other person and you're interacting with that other person. You can also talk mind to mind with other conscious entities, no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing, you can make those connections. So that's a little bit of, of, you know, my model and how it works. All right. So now let's talk about ETs, extraterrestrials, the things that, that people see in this reality that uh, are not necessarily UFOs. That's just an unidentified flying object. Everything doesn't have to be a flying object. You know, it may just be individuals that you connect with. Um, you might be beamed up to somebody else's spaceship. Not really beamed up. That's just a metaphor. You know, you may find yourself in a spaceship interacting with aliens. You may find that they are uh, inspecting your biology, that they're wanting to do some experiments with you. So all these things people experience, or you may just get information. Galactic Central sends you a message about Earth or about you or whatever. So there's all different modes of communication that you can have in this. And what it amounts to is that you are getting a data stream that defines those things. So if, if right now in my data stream, a little miniature flying saucer would zip by and, you know, sit here on my knee, well, if that's put in my data stream, then that is what I see. That's what I interact with. There's nothing more real than information. Reality is information. Okay. So you have to get out of your head the idea that this is a physical place. It's not a physical place. Consciousness is the only thing that's fundamental, and consciousness is not physical. It's information. Information is not physical. Information is meaning, it's significance. Okay, so just uh, all the little ink squiggles in a book are not information. Information comes when a consciousness interprets those little squiggles, ink squiggles in a book to mean something. That's the information. The squiggles of ink on a book themselves are not information. Okay, they're data. Data can be physical. Information is not physical. Information requires a consciousness to interpret the data and decide what it means. See, that's the interpretation of the data. Okay, so the larger consciousness system is all consciousness. It's an information system. It just deals in information 
and it doesn't have a lot of infrastructure. See, in the physical world, we have information processors, but they're big chunks of steel and silicon. So in this virtual reality we call the physical universe, our computers are, are big chunks of things. You know, they're massy and they have glass and silicon and wires and all kinds of plastic, all kinds of stuff in them. And that's the, the number cruncher. But in consciousness, consciousness is an information system. Consciousness doesn't have to have infrastructure. It's just information. You can think of it as a big mind, if you like. Okay, so it's 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 a piece of consciousness that's evolved to have this big mind, and part of that mind is us. Okay, we're a piece of that. So it sends us a data stream. We interpret the data. So I can interpret a little flying saucer that lands on my knee, and, uh, and the, the top of it pops off, and a little green guy jumps up and says, Hey, Tom. And I can have a conversation with him. You see, that's the data stream I get. Or I can be like in a meditation or lie down and, and, and relax. And suddenly I can find myself going up through space and in a spaceship. And somebody is, you know, I'm laid out on a table and somebody's saying, oh, look what this human does and how does it work? And, you know, that may be the case. That's a data stream that I'm getting. There isn't any reality other than virtual reality. See, there's the fundamental consciousness system, and everything else is created out of information. That's the only thing that exists is this information system. The fundamental, the LCS, larger conscious system. That's it. Nothing else exists. And we are piece parts of that, and we're in this big system that there's information, creates virtual realities for us so that we'll have more interesting, more consequential choices. You see, so when we're all in the chat room, nobody's, nobody's evolving. Nobody's lowering their entropy, which is what, how consciousness evolves. You lower your entropy by making choices. So while we have this virtual reality, we have very significant choices. Oh, no, I'm in a spaceship. Oh, I'm lying on this bed and they're doing things to me. What do I do? How do I react to that? What do I do with it? You see, the system has given me a set of conditions that I have to make choices in. And how I make those choices determines whether I evolve toward lower entropy, higher quality consciousness, or de-evolve. So if I look at it and I scream and I go, oh, no, and it's very fearful, and I get frightened by it, now, Fear, of course, is a very high entropy thing. So it's just a choice. I can be afraid and I can react with fear or I can react otherwise. You see, so it's my choice. Or maybe I'm not in a spaceship uh, lying on a bed someplace. Maybe I'm in the deep woods and there's a great big bear and I get to choose. How do I deal with that bear? Do I scream and run? Well, if I do, the bear will probably chase me because that's its instinct. It chases things, it runs, particularly things that smell tasty. So if that happens, then I'll probably get killed by the bear in this, in this dream. Well, that's information, my choice. So the system gives us lots of choices in lots of different contexts. And within those choices, we evolve by making those choices. We evolve. The whole point is to evolve toward higher quality consciousness, toward love, toward caring, toward cooperation, because that minimizes entropy. Remember, the system evolves to lower entropy. That's the nature of an of a information system. We're pieces. We're a little piece of that information system. We're here to evolve toward lower entropy. Consciousness and all its pieces form a social system. In a social system, the lowest entropy you can, you can do is by cooperating, caring, connecting. That's low entropy. Fighting, screaming at each other, uh, you know, being full of fear, that's high entropy. So we evolve by lowering our entropy. So yes, and it doesn't have to be just you. You can, you and 10 of your best friends can all be sitting on your back porch when this thing comes out of the air going blink, 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 and comes down and sits on, on the ground in front of you. 
And again, the top may pop off and the little green guys may come out with pointy ears and have a conversation with you. That means that all 10 of you are getting that same data stream. And you're all seeing it. You shake hands with them. They hand you a little object. You know, you put it in your pocket. They go back in the machine, they take off, and there you have it. You know, the grass is burned there in the middle, and you can see where the where the footprints were made indentations on the ground around it. And you reach in your pocket, and there's this little thing they gave you. Okay, and you have it. You've never seen a little thing like that before. Okay, so in your mind, that's real. There's nothing more real than information. And you and all 10 of your friends experienced it. You all agree. But you're the only one that got something in your pocket, but they all agree on that. Okay, so in your mind, it's real. When you go out of body, it's real. When you have a night dream, it's real. All these things are real in as much as you make choices, and by those choices, you evolve or de-evolve. That's the name of the game. We're here to lower our entropy, help the system evolve, or a piece of the system by evolving, lowering our entropy. I think that most of the experiences with UFOs and even the things left behind, like the little piece of metal or a little piece of whatever I got in my pocket, all of that is information. Remember, this is a virtual reality. The things here are also computed. So it can add a little piece of metal in my pocket or a little gizmo that does something or other because this is a virtual reality too. It's the same system creating all these virtual realities. So that then becomes physical. So that was a physical event. Now, there could have been somebody else that lived in the house next door that didn't see a thing, never saw anything at all. And they may have been out on their back porch too. And you go over and talk to them and you say, wow, that was amazing, wasn't it? Did you see that? And they may say, see what? And you well, how could you miss it? It was right there. You know, you were sitting on your porch. You would have seen it too. And they'd say, no, I didn't see anything. So that's a possibility. They did get the data stream. Or maybe they did get the data stream and they saw it too. It depends on what system is doing here. And it's giving you choices. It's giving you choices to make. And by these choices, you will be eventually become love and caring and evolve, or you'll de-evolve and get full of fear. So it depends. Now, that said, let's talk about one other thing, and that is that, so we imagine that these entities come from other planets and other places in our system. And I'm saying not necessarily. That could be the origin story. You know, and this little bunch of green guys, they may point at the star map and say, see, nah, nah, that's our star over there. They may say that. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. You're getting information, essentially, that gives you choices. That's what's important. And how you make those choices, that's important. The fact that that little green guy is telling the truth or not is irrelevant. He's part of a story that you're in, that you have choices for. You see, so that is, you know, that's the bigger picture. So I see um, the alien thing as taking place in consciousness. And one of the things that makes me think that that's true is that because what's going on here is that we get these virtual realities, we get these data streams to give us choices so that we can grow up, get rid of our fear. Okay. make better choices, get rid of our ego, get rid of our beliefs. Now, if you listen to some of the things that, that the system tells us in various ways, if you listen to, oh, channeled things like Seth Speaks, I say that because that was a long time ago when I was looking into those things and that's the one I read. Uh, we could probably make a fairly long list of these. Well, a lot of those things, it's good information. It's telling you to get rid of your ego, get rid of your fear, become love. You know, these the things you get are things that help you see bigger pictures 
and helps you understand and help you grow up. So we have those kinds of things. And somebody might say, oh, well, this channeled stuff comes from, from you know, Alpha Centauri, and this is the, you know, the lead, what, center of the galactic, you know, union or something is doing this. And because the earth is not too smart and his people have to grow up some. So we're trying to help them out so that one day we'll be able to let them join our union. Now, all that is just part of the story. That's part of the data stream makes a story. The story will end up giving you choices. So I looked around at all of the various ET stuff, channeled stuff, things people see, inter interactions that people get. And mostly, I mean, sometimes you just get wild fear stuff. Oh no, you know, alien abduction, oh no. You get wild fear things. Oh, the reptilians and whatever are going to come and eat everybody on the earth or take over the place. Sometimes you get just fear stories. But that's because people here are very fearful and they get some data in a data stream and they interpret it as fearful data, you know, scary data. They get upset by it, which creates more. The, the system just keeps feeding that story. So in a way, you're creating the story. We have influence in how the story goes. We make a choice and the system decides maybe what to give us in that choice, to give us another choice. So if you make fearful choices and you find fearful things, then you're going to report a lot of fearful stuff and you will be de-evolving your own personal consciousness. Your life will be full of fear. You won't be very happy. You'll be a constant set of turmoil. You have lots and lots of stress. And basically, it'll be a negative, your life will be a negative experience because that's not what we're here. We, we're here to do the opposite. So those experiences I've looked at overall, yes, there's a, some, there's a lot of fear junk in there where people have want, you know, gone off in fearful things because they're fearful people. And they've had fearful experiences and terrible experiences and awful things happen to them. But that's because they've made those choices. That's the kind of experience that felt real to them because they're fearful people and fearful things they gravitate to. So in a way, they create that story because of the choices they make and because of the way they are. Now, looking at the whole mass of it, particularly people who've been in the ET business for decades and decades and decades, the general overall picture you get is that these aliens, wherever they come from and whoever they are, are basically telling us what we need to do is cooperate, care, grow up, you know, love, take care of each other. We need to stop all the, the violence and the greed and all this sort of thing. Well, that's exactly the message that the larger conscious system is telling us through Seth Speaks or somebody else. So the system has lots of ways of contacting us and helping us make choices, helping us see bigger pictures. And I think the alien thing, let's call it an alien thing, all of it, is one of those ways in which it connects with us. You know, let's take prop circles. For example, okay, suddenly, uh, you know, 20 acres of land have this very intricate pattern laid out on it. And it's obvious by anybody who's rational that that couldn't have been done by a bunch of college kids or some bunch of farmers overnight in the dark with no noise. It's impossible. Couldn't do that. You'd have to have a group of probably 50 surveyors out there calculating all those angles and shapes and things and bending over little pieces of wheat you know, that would take months and lots of people and could only be done in the daylight so how did that happen well that's just a data stream information we get information we interpret it as a reality well, of course people who don't understand that consciousness is really the main thing is the fundamental thing. They would say, oh, well, aliens do it. Who else? We couldn't do it. There's no humans that could turn that 20 acres into a very intricate, complex design overnight in the dark. 
So it must be aliens do it. Well, it's the larger consciousness system. Remember, I said it does things to help wake us up, to help us see bigger pictures. Because if we see bigger pictures, we'll stop being so nasty to each other. We see bigger pictures and we see ourselves as a small thing in a big picture that has content and meaning. It's part of getting thinking out of the box because you can't grow up if you don't think out of the box. If you just think like everybody else, well, you're kind of stuck in ego space. You have to think out of the box. You need bigger pictures. So to help us get bigger pictures, it just presents us with these impossible things that jar us into thinking out of the box. You know, the physicists don't know everything. You know, they, they don't understand everything. There's more dimensions to reality and understanding than what you get in a physics textbook. So that's, that helps us grow up. So of course, it'll do things to trigger us. It'll do it on a grand scale for lots of people, like you know, the, the, the fields with the designs in them. You know, you'll, you'll get that because that will make 10,000, 100,000 people grow up who see it and read about it and look at the pictures, or it's individual. Sometimes just an individual will get something to help them grow up. You know, your, your mother dies and a week later you get a phone call and you pick it up and it's your mother. And she says something to you. She says, Oh, I just wanted you to know I'm okay. You know, that sort of thing. And you probably slam the phone down because you're so startled. Think somebody's playing a trick on you. And later you think, oh, that wasn't so nice hanging up on mom like that. Or other things happen. You just, somebody shows up at the foot of your bed and you talk to them. And maybe it was your mother. Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's just your best friend that you haven't seen for 20 years. You know, those kinds of things happen to help us individually get bigger pictures so that we understand reality isn't just this physical thing that's very limited so pop circles individual paranormal things that people get near-death experiences all sorts of things um, we get those to help us grow up and see bigger pictures that's what the ufo is too it's huh. helping us grow up and see bigger pictures so the system sends us things that gives us choices things we're interested in, things we want to interact with, and why not UFOs? Well, it's at least in the well, Tom, circles. Uh, you've traveled um, to these other realities through your through consciousness, and in some cases you have um, entered into that virtual reality with different rule sets. Mm -hmm. um, did you get any sense of why the rule sets were slightly different? Some are similar to ours, some have a looser rule set. And did you get a sense of the time? I know that time is different in different realities. You say that our reality is a one delta T at a time. Um, what would be the reason for different rule sets? and different times and how much time difference is there between the larger consciousness system say other realities and here and and why do you think that would be okay well these these various virtual realities exist because they have a function they have a purpose okay and mostly the purpose is to give individuated units of consciousness like us a chance to make choices interesting choices, meaningful choices, not just to chat in a big room, but choices that, that are significant, choices that, that make us stretch out and, and, and define who we are through these choices. In fact, that's a good thing to say. We are the sum of all the choices that we've made. That's who we are. So those choices are very important. That's who we are as individuals. That's who we are as, as humanity. It's all the choices we've collectively made together. You know, and so these choices are important. They define us and what we can become and what the possibilities are, are defined by these choices. So all the virtual realities have some sort of purpose in mind. Okay, there's this one we call our physical universe. The purpose there is to give individual units of consciousness a 
you know, an avatar with meaningful choices. Now there's the, we go to bed at night, we dream. There's a dream reality. It has a purpose too. Just because we're sleeping and our body needs rest doesn't mean we get to stop making choices. It's work, work, work all the time. So we go to sleep and we're still working. We're still making choices. And when we die, we become aware in another reality system. It's transition reality, another virtual reality. These things are all virtual realities and they're all equally real. They're all information. You see, so every virtual reality has a reason for being. Each one is a simulation. It's calculated, it's, it's a computed reality. And behind every dynamic computed reality is a delta T, an outer loop of time. So that this delta T, something happens, the next delta T, you know, you, it's changed. Otherwise it couldn't be changed. When I say a dynamic reality, it means a reality in which things change. Well, let's say you have a ball and it's moving across like this. Well, here it is now, delta T, it's over here, next delta T, it's here, next delta T, it's here. When delta T gets very, very small, then it looks smooth. It doesn't jump. If delta T is very big, then it boom, boom, boom. You know, it does those kinds of things. So the delta T is defined in relative to the function purpose of that virtual reality. Okay, so uh, in a dream reality, the delta T doesn't have to be that small. Motion and interactions needs to be fluid. But other than that, it doesn't have to be that small. Here in this reality, if you have a bunch of physicists over at CERN smashing things together to see what kind of little things come out, well, you need more smaller delta T, you see, to, to do that. So it's just different purposes. Realities have different times. But every virtual reality has its own rule set. That's what defines it and its own delta T. Now, time goes by. So the computer, which is the larger conscious system you know sets up pieces of itself subsets of itself to be the computers for these various virtual realities that computer has billions of billions of cycles that it can function that it can process between each one of our little delta t's okay now the lcs itself then has the fastest processing time it has the smallest delta t and our delta T is maybe a billion, billion, billion of its smaller delta T's. So it's plenty of time to get things done between our delta T's, to do all the computations that are necessary. Now in our world, you know, um, actually I, I might point this out as just a little verification. In any, in any reality frame, the delta T and the delta X Okay, the delta X, I just mean a little piece of distance if it's a 3D reality. Okay, if it's a 3D reality that's spatial, then you're going to have distance. If it's a 2D reality, you're going to have distance, it's spatial. So if it's a spatial reality, then it has to have what's the smallest spatial distance and what's the smallest time distance. Okay, now in our reality, we have come to the conclusion that we, we call the Planck length and the Planck time. Those are those smaller, that's the smallest unit of time, the smallest unit of distance. When we look at the sims, well, okay, the computer has a refresh rate, that's the delta T. You know, every, it refreshes every time, you know, it recalculates everything, and it has a, 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 a delta X that is basically pixel size, and you can't do anything less than that. So this delta X and delta T exist for every virtual reality. Now, this will give us a couple of clever things here. We can, we can see how that works. One, you know that the speed of light's a constant, right? That's one of the things that, that's what Einstein said. Hey, the, the speed of light's a constant. No matter what the source of the light is, it always goes the same speed. That's because the speed of light is as fast as you can go contiguously through the virtual reality. Every delta T, you get one delta X. The next delta T, another delta X. You can't get through the virtual reality by moving, you know, continuously, contiguously, one pixel to the next to the next, any faster than that. So that tells us why the speed of light's a constant. And every virtual reality, one delta X for one delta T. 
So now in our virtual reality, I just throw this in, doesn't have anything to do with ETs, but I just throw this in because it's interesting. In our virtual reality, or in any virtual reality, I should say, the computer doesn't want to have more resolution than it needs. The more resolution is just more computation. So it wants to be efficient. It doesn't want to do any more computation than what that reality you know, calls for or needs. So in our case, where humans first were just knuckle draggers, you know, with clubs and, and things and didn't have much in the way of technology. And now we have CERN and atom smashers and, and cyclotrons and things that dig deeply into the details of our reality. The resolution had to go up. In the beginning, you don't want all that resolution just because maybe someday, you know, they'll, they'll need it. That's a waste of computer resources. So you always have the reality that you need in the, re, you know, in the virtual reality that you're computing. So it turns out that we needed to have more resolution as science got to look in, you know, got microscopes, we need more resolution. And we have electron microscopes. Oh, we even need more resolution. Well, what happened was in, in anticipation of that, both delta X and delta T get smaller so that the ratio stayed the same. The ratio is the speed of light. Delta X divided by delta T is the speed of light. But we don't want the speed of light to change because there's a lot of things in our reality that kind of depend on that value. So to keep it the same, they'd have to change, you know, let's say if you, if you made uh, delta T only half as big, then you have to make delta X only half as big. Except these things are digital. You can't make them just a half. They come in pixels. You can't find a pixel in the middle. So you can only make delta, delta T smaller and make delta X smaller as best you can in the pixels to keep the ratio the same. You may not be able to make them exactly the same because they have to be one pixel or the other. And the distance pixels are not the same size as the time pixels. So, you know, so that what would happen, what we would predict is that through our history, every so often, the speed of light will change in about the uh, eighth, ninth, tenth decimal place. Not much because those pixels are small. You can get pretty close, but they won't be exactly the same. Now we can measure the speed of light, say to 15 decimal places. So a change in the 10th decimal place is real. That's a that's a change. It's not just a, a calculation error that's a, or a measurement error. That's a real change. And sure enough, we've seen that. Our physicists will tell you that, you know, I don't know, four or five times we've seen, we have measured speed of light to be a tiny bit different. And, and does that why. depend on the resolution needed for what's being observed? Yeah, that's because the system says, uh-oh, these avatars are getting very close to needing this higher resolution. I'm going to have to change the system and give them higher resolution. So it changes the speed of light. It doesn't change the speed of light. It, it changes the delta T and the delta X such that it tries to keep the speed of light a constant, but it can't because these things are pixelated. You can't just make up any number at once. It has to be the pixels. So, Yes, and then the system says, whoops, well, they've gone even further than that now. Okay, we're way past electron microscopes. Now we're into, you know, atom smashing, little tiny things. And we have to give them more resolution so that when they measure things that are that small, there'll be something there. You know, the, re the resolution will be able to find something. So, yes, so we expect that the delta T will change out in those places, and it does. So there's lots of things like that in physics that support this theory, you know, where you, the theory says, well, you should see this kind of thing. And sure enough, we see that kind of thing. So I just kind of threw that in, but basically, you know, that's a little uh, bit of confirmation that the theory is a good theory. It works. Um, it, it actually resolves all of these paradoxes that are in physics. That was just one paradox is in physics. Why does this be the light? change every once in a while out in the you know, 10th, 9th decimal place out there. Why is that? Well, now well, that solves that paradox. And there's lots of paradoxes in physics, like why does quantum physics work the way it does? You know, why should, should particles be best 
modeled as probability distributions and this theory explains why it's like that the observer effect explains why it's like that so in any case there is it's not just tom campbell's wild idea there is a lot of physics that this supports As a matter of fact all of those paradoxes are are settled and solved by this theory so if that theory is true if i say this is just a model it's a model of reality reality modeled in as the function of consciousness consciousness is the fundamental thing which is a is a philosophy that's called uh, idealism it's been around for thousands of years that the consciousness is fundamental anyway uh, so that's how i see the ets i think it's mostly a phenomenon of consciousness that uh and somebody would say oh it wasn't just a dream it was real i saw it i felt that i got the thing in my pocket here see and this is something that they'll look at and nobody will know what it is well that's okay that's this is a virtual reality the system can make anything happen it wants to in a virtual reality so yes you did see it yes that was true that is your experience that doesn't mean this isn't a virtual reality your experience is your interpretation of the data stream you get here you see and your neighbor didn't necessarily have to see it you know those things happen or he could see it it just depends on how what is the system wants to make this a bigger group thing like a crop circle you know that's a thing for lots of people to see or is it just something for you to give you a chance to make choices that are lower entropy everything happens in consciousness it's not just that et stuff happens in consciousness everything happens and you've clarified yes you've clarified with your theory of everything that um there are other virtual realities with other rule sets and the reasons for that uh the reasons for the the time differences but it all boils down to different experiences now what do you you've traveled to a lot of these realities i say traveled i mean mind space consciousness space um what does do how does diversity fit into these other realities some you say are very much like ours and some are extremely different is the reason for the extreme difference and can you can you give an example of what some of the diversity that you've seen in these other virtual realities are and is that the reason is is that the reason for um a richness of experience this diversity well, and what kind of example can you give us well of course just as i said the larger kinds of system wants to have lots of choices diversity creates more choices if you just have a couple of things and it's a, that same thing over and over and over again there are not many choices so the whole system runs on lowering entropy the richer the sort of you know the the richer the set of choices the richer the decision space then the more it can evolve the more it can grow now like anything else if it evolves it continues if it de-evolves it eventually de-evolves to the point that there's no bits but random it dies so it's a thing i say a real thing this is not a, a some kind of supernatural thing it's this consciousness but it can either evolve or de-evolve. And if it de-evolves too far, it dies, it goes away. So it doesn't want to die and go away. So it wants to evolve. And the richer the diversity, the more choices, the more meaningful the choices, the better, and everything evolves. So that's why there is a lot of diversity. That's why the system doesn't have all its eggs in just one basket. Okay, this our physical universe, and that's it. There isn't anything else ever but that. Well, that would be silly for the system to do that. There's lots of other possibilities. Why not explore all the possibilities you can? Because every set of possibilities gives new choices. And by having lots of diverse choices, we have a higher probability of evolving and not the evolving what have you personally okay. noticed that was extremely different from how our virtual reality works well 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 basically 
if I look at those, just those virtual realities that are physical, like real tight rule sets, I find that the very fundamentals of their physics, you know, their rule set are really very similar to ours. They're not that different. And yeah, there are small differences, but this, they're not greatly different. And I think the reason for that is it's not that easy to come up with a set of initial conditions and a rule set and have that evolve to become stable. You know, um, here's another thing that just that, that gives it a, a sense of, of, uh, of rightness is that, you know, can imagine the system. It starts with, and here's a rule set and here are my initial conditions. You know, this is like Big Bang, right? The initial conditions are this tight ball of plasma, high energy, you know, very small spot, uh, very high pressures. And the rule set's basically what we call science. It's our physics. It's the rules of how the stuff can change. Hits the run button, and that means it can expand. It, because that's the rule set. The rule set says it's real high pressure and whatever, it expands. So it expands and it creates this virtual reality. Now. It didn't just make up that initial conditions in the rule set on the first time because it's brilliant. It took its best guess and pushes the run button, you know, big bang, take one, mm, boom. It goes for about three milliseconds and crashes, right? Oh, let's turn gravity down a little bit. It all sucked back into a bigger ball. You know, we don't want that. So, you know, big bang, you know, take two and so it changed things a little bit, changed things a little bit. So it kept doing that over and over and over. And eventually it had this rule set and these initial conditions just tuned really, really right so that you'd get something that would last long enough, was stable long enough to create, to evolve things that were really complex like us, you know, like the planet Earth, like people. It takes a long time, right? This universe is. I don't know, so many billions of years old. It took it that long before it could. I remember that's our time, billions of years in those, you know, those big fat delta T's of ours. And it, it took it that long. It had to be stable that long for it to produce something useful, avatars that were, that were useful. Okay, so that being the case, we should expect that there's like four or five or six of these universal constants that physics has that will all be tuned to each other. You know, that, that if indeed you changed any one of them, even in the eighth or 10th decimal place, the whole thing would fall apart. You know, the universe wouldn't be stable. And that's exactly what we find. You know, they call that the anthropic principle in physics. And that is there's these sets of constants and they are all tuned to 10 decimal places and if you fiddled with any of them, any of them, changed them just the teeniest bit, this whole universe would have collapsed and, you know, disappeared. It wouldn't have lasted long enough. So, yeah, you know, big digital bang, take 10,000, you know, and uh -oh, got to tweak this a little bit more, got to tweak that a little. So that's what you'd expect. And that's what we do find. We find that we've got these numbers that are, are, uh, perfectly balanced. So when I find other realities that are physical like ours, very tight rule sets, they're not that different in the basic fundamentals of their existence because you can't just take any old initial conditions and any old rule set and have something that lasts long enough to, to work. It's a very complex system and it has to be tuned very well. So once the system went to that trouble, you know, <laughs> Big digital bang, tank, take 10 million, you know. Once it finally figured that out, I'm sure it uses it over and over again. You know, copy, paste. So you start. So a lot of that is similar. Fundamentals, you know, the physics tends to be similar, not exactly the same. But now what's hugely different is what evolves in that space. That can be hugely different. So they don't all evolve with humanoid shapes, you know, with a head and two arms and two legs and that kind of stuff. They can evolve to all sorts of things. Just like we've evolved, what, trillions of different kinds of people, plants, insects, you know, all sorts of things have evolved here. There's a possibility with this rule set. 
all kinds of things evolve there too, but they're not necessarily evolving the same way because evolution is a process fractal. It takes what you have, feeds that back into it as an input, and then you get new stuff. And then whatever that new stuff is, that goes back into evolution as an input. So every place evolution goes, it's trying to optimize what we have against the environment that it needs to, to be in. So even if those environments are similar, if you started the earth off all over again, we wouldn't necessarily evolve this way. You know, it's all circumstance. This happens to evolve this thing. Now you got these big dinosaurs and they go eat everything. All right, you know, that, that kept the small animal population, you know, down. It wasn't until they, dinosaurs, left that now those vertebrates and the other small little things that were being eaten could evolve and grow up, you know, so they get a chance. So it's only because that meteor hit and those dinosaurs went away that this other stuff started to grow. So what I'm saying is it's, it depends. Each system is going to happen differently. So what evolves there is going to be functional, but doesn't have to look like us at all. And yes, I've found some things that are actually similar to us and other, you know, they kind of look like it could be like an earth kind of thing with things that look like human sort of things. But I've also found things that are not like us that are totally different so in what ways i mean it well this is how they move how they how they get around what you know and that depends on gravity you know if you change gravity if you got a smaller planet or a bigger planet you know you have more or less gravity well what evolves there is different you know it just depends on how that how that works so the, you know rule set are pretty much the same so everywhere you got gravity but the actual particulars of what's going on are all very different, all different possibilities. So you've got different kinds of things. That so heavier because, gravity would make a denser sort of... Um... Well, no, you'd have to have bigger, stronger things if they were moving around with heavier gravity. If the, if okay. the Earth's gravity was, you know, was 10 times greater, then instead of weighing 10 pounds, you'd weigh 100 pounds. Instead of weighing 100 pounds, you'd weigh 1,000 pounds. Well, if you weighed 1,000 pounds, you'd have to be a little bigger with bigger muscles than we have in order to get around than that. You, you wouldn't probably walk on two legs. It might not be a, a functional thing anymore. So just the environments are going to be very different. The basic physics, that there is a thing called gravity, there is a thing called matter, that's going to be very similar because that, that works. So those are the sorts of differences. Now, one other thing I'd like to talk about with the aliens, I don't want to get too far away from the aliens here, is that if you look at a, you know, we talk about these aliens come from other planets in our universe. And what physicists would tell you today is that, wow, there's trillions and trillions of suns. And of those trillions of trillions, maybe even trillions of trillions of trillions of suns, lots of suns out there. The universe is big. And with that many suns, the probability that there's another situation sort of like Earth where you have a stable sun, you have a planet that's not too close to be too hot, not too far away to be too cold, you know, has just all the right things you need, that there would be life someplace. Well, the probability, of course, is high because there's so many instances of suns and planets everywhere that certainly there must be thousands if not hundreds of thousands of other places where life evolved. Therefore, surely there's things out there. We're not the alone, we're not the only one. When I say there's, there's nobody else but us, what I mean is there may not be anyone else but us. You know, this is just a model. You know, I'm not saying here's the truth and you guys need to see it. I'm saying this is a model, like all models. You know, you, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you, know, you can find some other model. But what I mean by that is that in this virtual reality, this one virtual reality we call the physical universe, there may not be any more than just us on this planet Earth. And it's not a waste of computation. It's not a waste of resources at all. Just us, whole thing, just for us. Everything else is just pretty lights in the sky that are never computed except when somebody looks at them. Now, 
my model doesn't start there with this being a physical reality. It just looks like a physical reality to us, okay? Because we're the avatars, okay? If you were an elf running around in World of Warcraft, you'd think that World of Warcraft was a physical place because if you ran into a tree, it would hurt. If you fell off a cliff, you know, that would hurt too. If you stay underwater too long, you drown there. And, you know, so we're avatars here. So it looks physical to us. So we, th we believe it's physical. But this is a virtual reality. Now, in a virtual reality, nothing is rendered that isn't in a data stream to something, right? The system doesn't just make up data streams and send them to know what. The virtual reality itself doesn't exist, right? World of Warcraft doesn't really exist someplace where there's little elves and barbarians running around fighting each other. Doesn't exist. It only exists in the minds of the players. The players get the data streams. They interpret that data. And in order to get something in that virtual reality, it has to come through the mind of a player. The whole reality only exists in the minds of the players. All right, now what does that say about this universe? Here we are, and this whole universe only exists in the minds of the players. All right, now there may be players in all these other hundreds of thousands of planets, other places. But now how many seats does this larger consciousness system need, right? It's got individuated unit of consciousness. It's creating virtual realities for them to run around in and make choices because it helps them evolve, helps the whole system evolve. They're part of the system. They evolve a little, the system evolves a little with them. So, how many seats does it need? Okay, it's got 8 billion of us here, 8 billion seats, all trying to evolve. I've been to others. I don't know what the population of those other places were. I didn't, that wasn't something you can tell by being there. But let's say they were like us, another 8 billion, right? So I've been to a dozen of these other reality frames. So there's other reality frames. How many seats? Does a system need? How many parts do you break yourself into to evolve before the overhead costs more than what you get back for the extra evolution? See what I mean? All systems have curves that tell you when, if you make the system any bigger, your cost in making it bigger is more than the benefit of making it bigger. So there's right up in the beginning, let's make it bigger. More is better, more is better. Eventually you get that sweet spot and then you go past that sweet spot and it's more is not better. More is just another data stream overhead. I've got a service, another, another player I've got to calculate all this stuff for and just one more IUOC on the treadmill of evolution doesn't make that much difference to the system. So the system isn't going to just have Trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions of, of IUOCs doing this because it's too expensive for what you get out. So it's only going to have a certain number. So then let's say that this virtual reality, 8 billion seats is enough. And you'd say, oh, but what a waste. Oh, all those trillions of suns and all those planets. No, this is a virtual reality. Nothing's computed unless a player needs the data so they don't exist they don't exist at all there aren't trillions and trillions and trillions of suns all right we look in the microscope and we say oh look trillions 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 of suns out there all right great those are all little dots of light turn that microscope off it's no longer computed just like i said the oxygen isn't computed your brain and your head is not computed none of those things show okay so point is, if you, are, if you are the system and trying to get as much bang for the buck, be efficient with your computer science, get as much evolution for as little overhead as possible, you see, get that sweet point, then you're not necessarily going to want tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of planets like ours all spouting off, you know, 8 billion people. You don't have that many, you don't want that many IUOCs in the game. You don't need that many. It's, it's gone past point of being useful. So you doesn't mean that you 
can't, that you don't have all those sons because the sons don't really ever get computed unless somebody looks at them. So at night, when the stars come out, you say, oh, look at all those pretty little points of light. But a point of light is nothing. It's just a magnitude of the light and a color, perhaps. That's it. A couple of bits. A computer can make dots of light really cheaply. And then you get some guy looks through a big telescope or sends up a satellite with a big telescope. And as that telescope looks at it, the system has to compute what's there and let take a picture, shows what's there, and then it stops computing it. Just like procedural computing, like No Man's Sky, right? No Man's Sky has a quadrillion different planets in it, but they're not all computed. Only when somebody looks at one is it computed. You stop looking, it's not computed anymore. You turn your head back around, it's computed. Fly off that planet, go someplace else, it's not computed anymore. Come back to that planet and the system will look at it and say, well, you've been gone for 20 years. There've been this many changes for the evolution of that planet, so here's what we'll show you. And that's it. So now suddenly you see things, rivers are changed course maybe, and a few other things, because all the time things happen. You know, So that's the way it works here too. It's the same way. Procedural programming is just more efficient. You don't need a huge mainframe to compute quadrillions of planets. All you need is a, a little computer that uses random, you know, random generators, and you don't need a lot of memory. All the stuff you compute is not saved in memory. It's just recomputed. So you just have to save a set of numbers, of the random numbers that got that particular picture, and then you come back out and there it is, you progress it a little bit and that's what you send. And you only send that to the player, what they're looking at. Well, that means that you're not wasting. There are trillions and trillions of suns that are all being wasted. All that's out there in this whole universe and nothing's happening. They're all sterile. Ah, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Of course it doesn't make any sense, but they're not there. All they are is the spots of light that get set to us, unless you're, you've got a big telescope and then there are a little more than spots of light. They have some detail, but the details only computed for you and your data stream while you're looking through that thing. This speaks so well to your yeah. um, theory yeah. that is a closed efficient yeah. system and yeah. uh, your spin on this alien well, subject that we're on. There's an end to that, Donna, and that is that there's a thing called the Fermi paradox. And the Fermi paradox was the scientists got together and said, where are they? Where are these ETs? They should have passed through here a long time ago. There's another part of the universe that is much older than us, billion years older than us. Okay, now human, you know, we've only been here, our Earth has only been here for, you know, a lot less than that. So these other people would have been evolving another billion years past how long we had to evolve. Well, how much further are we going to be in a billion years? You can't even imagine it. So even at sub-light speed, going to the next place, the next place, you know, this moon, it's just working your way through that universe, expanding through the universe at the rate at which people expand. You know, they got data from how people expand. Then they would have been through here. Our part of the universe, everything that could be inhabited would be inhabited. And with the kind of technology you'd have if that many billions of years advanced of us, everything. But we look around and we don't see anybody. So Fermi, we call that the Fermi paradox. Fermi was a famous physicist, a uh, quantum physicist. And, and uh, he said, there's a paradox here. There should be so many ETs have been through here already, moved on to other places to expand to and yet they're not, and we don't see them, and we don't see their, sim their images, we don't see their light, we don't see their electromagnetic fields, we don't see anything to indicate that. We don't see their structures. We don't see any of it. So, big paradox, why not? Where are they? Well, there's never been a really good answer for that. And there's been a lot, if you Google it, you'll see, here's the 10 best answers, and none of them are judged to be very good. The Fermi paradox is judged to be logically, a very strong paradox. The answers to that so far have not been judged to be nearly as strong as a paradox, which means they don't, they're not really good answers. 
The answer is, we're the only ones here. It's just us. The system doesn't need any more seats than 8 billion or 10 billion or 15, whatever we're to become. And no, there's not a big waste. The system only consists of virtual reality. The system just computes what it needs for the players that are in the game because the virtual reality only exists in the minds of the players. It doesn't really exist out there as solid, massy suns and things, just like World of Warcraft. There's not a lot of little elves and barbarians running around someplace. Rivers and streams and trees doesn't exist. It only exists in the minds of the players. And 10 billion players are enough for this particular game. You see, now that's a strong solution to the Fermi paradox. So if it's a virtual reality, it's not that there's a waste of all that universe. It's actually very efficient that the virtual realities are very efficient. Only compute what you need to, and you only need to when you have a player who's requesting data because they're looking under that rock. Now you got to send them some data to show them what's under that rock. If they don't look under that rock, you don't have to send them anything about what's under that rock. You never compute it. So that would then solve the Fermi paradox. And so that's my whole take on the ET thing. And certainly there's ETs because there's so many possible planets, you see, not necessarily true. If this is a virtual reality, it doesn't work that way. And the fact that this model explains quantum physics, it derives relativity, it um, tells you why speed of light has changed a little bit out in those, those long, you know, that eighth or tenth decimal place. It tells you why there's this bunch of, uh, of numbers all tuned for each other, and on and on. Other, other uh, things that are paradoxes are all solved with this idea. So guys, that's my take on on ETs, on whatever. They're Thank all you, Tom. Part, yeah, they're <laughs> all part of consciousness. They're all part of this big consciousness thing, as are we. And it's not necessarily a physical thing. And you know, quantum physics 100 years ago said that materialism's wrong. It just doesn't work. And we've had our heads stuck in the sand for 100 years now trying to pretend that it does work. But it doesn't. This is not a material existence. Physicists, you know, you go to, you know, your best physicists at MIT and they will tell you that this reality is information based because that's what their experiments tell them. And that we think it's matter based. We pretend it's matter based because that's because we're, we're avatars in here. It looks like it's matter based to us, but it's not. It's really information based. And that's that's the reality that we live in. All about consciousness, all about growing up and becoming love. That's the big picture. Thank you, Tom. No matter what virtual reality you're in, that's the goal. It's one common goal, right. evolving towards love. Thank you for your science spin. This has been fascinating. Your science spin on aliens and how you see it through your My Big Toe Theory. Thank you. Welcome.